I am Second Lieutenant Tony Needham, representing the Air Force Academy. I graduated from the Air Force Academy this last year, and now I'm working as an admissions advisor for Washington, Oregon, and Alaska. So I'm essentially here to help all of you who are about to apply to finish their application and get started. So uh, like my fellow Service Academy said, same requirements, same process. Timeline's a little different. Ours opens for juniors March 15th, and will stay open until December 31st of your senior year. Now, this is the process to get started. Um, like everyone else has said, get those applications done early. I'll tell you right now, if you start the application after November, the chances of you getting in or even completing the application just drop significantly. It's not a pretty picture. I recommend start it before August. Uh, start looking to your congressmen and senators. Start looking for when their deadlines are due. And uh, just make sure you have everything ready to wrap up and turn into the academies by November at the latest. Thank you. Roy, and it's good to see you. Do you want to follow up with the ROTC, the sure. Army ROTC? Um, and, and my name is uh, Roy Sesuico. I, I am the Recruiting Operations op Officer out of OSU. Now, um, as far as Army ROTC, the application process begins June 12th every year. It ends February 4th of every year. There are three scholarship boards that meet. The first one meets in uh, November, or correction, October. The second one meets in January, and the third one meets in March. So as long as you get your scholarship application in, uh, you're doing fine, all right? Uh, in essence, you have uh, three opportunities to receive an, an Army ROTC scholarship. What I normally tell students is that go ahead and apply for the academies, okay? Use ROTC as a backup just in case, all right? Uh, whether you're going Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, it doesn't matter. Use ROTC as a backup, okay? One way or, uh, or another, you, 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 act, you actually may receive a commission, whether it's Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marines, or even Coast Guard, okay? Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Lieutenant Martin Neal, do you want to follow up the Coast Guard? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Sorry, I had some tech issues. I had to adjust my space. So, of course, uh, we're thankful to be here this evening. Um, our process is a little bit different because we do not require the congressional nomination. So um, it really just makes the process a little bit simpler for students. All that really means is our application will open for rising high school seniors. Application will open mid-July. Uh, we'll have an early action and a regular admission. So early action will be non-binding, just an opportunity to find out sooner. October 15 deadline and the regular admissions pool will be uh, a deadline of January 15. So of course, sooner you get the ball rolling, sooner uh, the process, or, or the easier the process will be for you and the sooner you will find out. So like everyone else said, um, get the ball rolling sooner than later, you'll thank yourself later. So thank you again for having us. Absolutely. Uh, we did have a question in the chat box and some of you kind of hit on this. Does the January 31st deadline apply to all academies? West Point is yes, we are 31 jam. Air Force Academy is not 31st of January. Ours is December 31st to start. And it'll any, uh, depending on when you start, it'll be either November or March when you have to turn in the final application based on when you start, of course. So I, I believe it's going to fall into different categories for each of the uh, the academies. So I would check their websites. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to our office as well. All right. Question number two, what are the academies looking for in a candidate and what can they do to pre prepare now if they're a junior? And do we want to start with West Point again? West Point is primarily a leadership development institution. Uh, we are looking for young people with terrific leadership potential. We're also looking for good students. And we're looking for those who are physically fit, medically qualified, who can uh, perform the rather physical rigorousness of being an Army officer. It is a vigorous physical profession. Uh, you must be in shape. You must stay in shape. Uh, there are, unfortunately, 
uh, young people who apply who are not medically qualified, and that's, that's sad, but there are medical requirements. So we are looking for good students and good leaders. What can you do to apply now or to prepare now as a junior? Uh, if you're only starting to prepare as a junior, you're going to have to hustle. There are uh, suggestions we have for academic preparation, four years of math, four years of English, two years of language, uh, physics, chemistry. If as a junior, you're starting to get, you want to get cranking on that, it's going to be a tough, it's going to be tough to catch up. And uh, I'll be happy to send you uh, our recommendations on academic preparation. Participate in sports, participate in uh, school clubs, community clubs, church groups, strive for leadership. Uh, participation is great, leadership is a lot better. That's what we're looking for. Thank you. Benjamin, what's the United States Naval Academy looking for? And what can they do to prepare? Let me unmute there. Um, so the Naval Academy is looking for a lot of the same things. Um, we do want to see leadership. We want to see involvement in organizations outside of just school. Uh, academics are a big part. Um, STEM fields, math, science, chemistry, engineering, if that's something your school has. Um, we do take that into consideration. It is looked at very highly when you go in front of the admissions board or your application goes in front of the admissions board. Um, what I would say you can do to start preparing now is start thinking about taking your exams. Um, it seems silly, but this past year we had a lot of folks who waited until the last minute to start taking them. And they were kind of out of luck when the time came, there weren't any dates available for them. Um, especially to start looking into things like getting your vital documents set up, your birth certificate, your transcripts. These are very small things, but if left until the last minute, they will hamstring your application process and they will keep you from completing your application in a timely manner. Um, also too, if you're struggling in certain classes, and we see this time and time again, ask for help. Uh, we see a lot of kids who will tell us a story saying, you know, I, I just, I'm not very good at this. That's not an excuse that's gonna fly here at the Naval Academy. You, you can't come here and say, I mean, we, we have academic assistance here, absolutely, 100%. But just saying, mm, no, I can't do it. That's not gonna, that really is going to reflect poorly on you. And unfortunately, if you're saying that in your application process, the admissions board's gonna pick up on it and they're not going to look at you. They're not gonna rate you quite so highly for that reason. So definitely, start developing yourself, you know, even incrementally into somebody who can overcome adversity as opposed to just throwing your hands up and going, I can't do it. Get, get, I can't do it out of your vocabulary. Thank you so much. Natasha, who is the Air Force ROTC looking for and what can they do to prepare? With Air Force ROTC, like I said before, your main priority really is to get into college. Um, whether if you're in Oregon, you're looking for the University of Portland or Oregon State University, or if you're going out of state, really focus on getting into college. And if you're interested in a scholarship and you are a junior, you won't have to start the application until about this July, if you're a junior right now. And so you can reach out to me to start that application process. And realistically right now, what you should be focusing on, especially throughout your entire senior year, is getting good grades and studying for your SAT and ACT, especially if you want a scholarship, that's probably one of the biggest reasons that someone might not get a scholarship. Now, given this past year, it was waived, but there's no guarantee that that might happen again. So utilize this time, use Khan Academy, take your classes seriously. Everything that everyone has said thus far is very important. So if you're interested in Air Force ROTC, take what everyone else is saying and apply it to the same, um, to this program as well. Thank you so much. And Lieutenant Needham, what is the Air Force Academy looking for? Uh, essentially with us and all the service academies, we're looking for the best. We're looking for people who have vision, who take initiative, 
um, essentially people who join uh, your, those extracurricular clubs. And not only do they join, but they take up leadership positions. They go above and beyond. They show that they can take uh, this club essentially and turn it into gold, right? And as a junior, our application specifically is built to where you can add on during your senior year and tell us what you've been doing and show your accomplishments. But really it is best for you to prepare as early as possible. And it's best that junior year, you are just trying to convince us that you are a person who has that vision, who knows what they're doing and knows that they can take something and make it so much better and has ideas for the future and all that stuff. So essentially vision and initiative. If that's you, outstanding. And that's Absolutely. exactly what we're looking for. Excellent. Roy, you want to follow up with that? Sure, same thing for the Army side. Um, the big thing is your SAT scores or ACT scores, one or the other, it doesn't matter. Um, high school uh, GPA is a big factor also. Any extracurricular activity, all right? Um, so again, we're looking for leaders. Same thing as USMA, same, same thing as anyone else here, all right? We're looking for leaders because in the Army, that is what you will be doing. You will be leading soldiers, um, most, like, most likely during the first day, okay? Once you're assigned to your unit, you will be a platoon leader in charge of any, anywhere from 15 to 40 soldiers right off the bat, okay? So we are looking for leaders. And again, don't, don't wait to apply for these scholarships, okay? Because we do have a, a, a finite amount of money, right? This year alone, uh, some of our high school applicants uh, during the first board, uh, they, were, they were pretty much looking at anywhere from a 1350 and above on their SAT scores, okay? So that's what they were looking for. And that's who they were awarding scholarships to. Uh, one thing too on the Army side, a lot of our, our aircraft are helicopters. So if you're looking for fixed wing, the Army may not be your best choice if you're looking for fixed wing aircraft. Okay, so just be aware of that, All right? Excellent, thank you. And welcome, Pat McAllister. Um, what are the Merchant Marines looking for in a candidate? And what can they do to prepare if they're a junior right now? Well, the Merchant Marine Academy really is looking for the same uh, type of character that we see in the Naval Academy, in the in West Point, in the Air Force Academy, and even the ROTC. Our mission is to educate and graduate leaders of exemplary character who are inspired to serve the national security, marine transportation, and economic needs of the United States as licensed merchant marine officers and commissioned officers in the armed forces. And this is the one thing that makes King's Point just a little bit unique. Upon graduation, um, the midshipmen can elect to go on active duty in virtually every branch of the armed services. Uh, if they do so, they need to serve uh, for eight years in the Naval Reserve, and they would be uh, looking for at least six years on active duty. Um, when they graduate, they will have a bachelor of science degree. They accept a commission in either reserve or active duty, and they obtain their US Coast Guard license as a third mate or third assistant engineer. One other unique aspect of King's Point is that all of the midshipmen are required to spend at least 300 plus days at sea on board either a merchant ship or on board uh, Navy ships. Uh, the US Coast Guard requires that in order for them to be able to sit for their licenses. And this is uh, really unique because these young men and women get to sail all over the world. I just recently saw some pictures of a bunch of them on uh, one of the Maersk ships that was stranded there in the Suez Canal trying to get home, you know, but, um, they go all over the world. And the important thing is that they're really learning their trade. They're learning what the deck officer does or what the engineering officer does. It's a great, uh, great unique aspect of uh, 
the Kings Point Education Program. Um, the, as far as the test scores and that, they virtually require, you know, the same thing that the other DOD schools do. Uh, we are under the Department of Transportation. And for instance, in this year's class, they had to get a waiver uh, as they're not requiring SAT or ACT scores. Now for the class of 2026, which is really probably what we're talking about here, it would have to be, again, a waiver granted by the DOT uh, as far as whether or not they have to have SAT and ACT scores. Um, nominations are, are similar, but a little different from the other federal academies. Um, we don't use principal appointments in that. Each member of the Senate and congressmen can appoint 10 nominations to Kings Point each year. And what they do is they'll then send those nominations in to the Academy and they will do the ranking uh, of the uh, uh, midshipmen. And as soon as they fill out, for instance, the state's allotment, then they will go into the national pool and draw from there. Uh, each entering class is about 280 uh, per year. Highly competitive, just like the other schools. Uh, the other thing is you better be very strong on your science side. The math, uh, you really wanna have calculus. Um, chemistry or physics are a requirement. If you have both, that's great yet. Um, the other thing is they look at, in part of the leadership program that Kings Point is looking for is, you know, your uh, contributions to your community and what you do in your high school as far as athletics and, and that is concerned. Um, as far as the, the medical, uh, you must be qualified by DOD um, MERB, just as the other academies are. You must pass the CFA uh, test. Uh, must pass Navy standards for uh, height and weight. Uh, Kings Point does have two prep schools that they're associated with it is New Mexico Military Institute and the Marion Military Institute. So if you didn't make it this year and really want to go, then those two are schools that uh, offer that uh, opportunity. When you graduate, you have a obligation to serve in the maritime industry for five years, maintain your Coast Guard license for six years, and serve in the U.S. Naval Reserve for eight years, or five years active duty in any of the nation's armed forces. Um, commercial? Hey, yes. Uh, we do have several other questions we have to get through. Uh, oh, okay. So, okay. <laughs> All right, let me just see if there's anything. Now, I think we... Um, you know, I hit the highlight here. We're also known to have the best kept secret, no more. Uh, and I know, uh, Fritz, I've worked with you quite a bit and we've gotten good support from the other federal academies. If your candidates don't get there, you can talk to them about uh, Kings Point, especially if people want to be pilots. Uh, that's a great opportunity because Kings Point can send people into Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, uh, Army, Coast Guard and they can all become pilots. Okay, Mike, I'll uh, end it there. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Martineau, what, what is the Coast Guard Academy looking for in a candidate and what can they do to prepare? Yes, I'll keep it pretty simple here. Uh, everything's gonna be the same as far as what we're looking for for well-rounded individuals, leadership over participation, strong academics, focusing on courses like chemistry, calculus and physics right now while you're in high school. Uh, but really, we don't have the nomination. So um, I will say that our process is simply a little bit simpler, right? So while you're in high school, you know, start thinking about what you are doing for community service. Start uh, creating a resume. You know, really just capture everything that you're a part of, leadership awards, those high-level courses. Um, it's only going to help you in all of your applications. So um, if you're not already involved in uh, some sort of community service, get involved whether it be through a local parish or a sports team, whatever it may be, um, you wanna first hit that service to others if you're gonna be applying to service academies. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. And this next question I'll ask to 
just one or two of the academies and then one of the ROTCs, is it advisable to apply to all the academies, even if you are only interested in a couple? And anyone can jump in here. I'll dive say, in. Oh, go for it. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll just make it quick here. Um, I'd say yes. So um, I know a lot of people apply to Coast Guard Academy, even if they know they want USAFA, because um, it's just another opportunity, especially with us not having the nomination requirement. But um, I think just kind of getting your foot in the door, regardless of the service right now, of course, it's going to be important for you to identify um, and look beyond the next four years. It's going to be more about service than it is the next four years service academy. Each academy is going to be important, but you need to think, you know, what do you want to do long term? So don't just fixate on the next four years. Again, the academy is important, but fixate on what you want to do the rest of your life. So um, we understand that you're still making these decisions and um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities put in front of you. So for now, um, make as many, uh, you know, set yourself up for success, apply for more than one. Fantastic. Thank you. And Pat, do you have to add on to that? Yeah, absolutely. I sit on nominating panels for a couple of the congressmen and senators, and we find that it is critically important that uh, the young men and women look for multiple uh, academy nominations, especially, you know, it's very, very competitive. Uh, I see Air Force and Navy for uh, people wanting to be pilots. Well, not everybody's going to make it. So how about King's Point? Because you can end up at the same point. So we encourage the young men and women to look at multiple academies uh, when they're looking uh, to get into one of the DOD schools or King's Point. Fantastic, thank you. Does uh, one of the ROTCs want to jump on that? Sure. Um, the big thing here is that um, it really doesn't matter which service you want to serve in, okay? If you want to serve, apply to every single scholarship you can. Same thing with the service academies. Apply, apply for everything, all right? Hopefully something will develop. But if you don't apply, okay? a lost opportunity there. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Roy. Uh, the next question is, when should I start meeting with my ALO or my field force representative? Fritz, what do you think? We find out from uh, West Point when a young person has uh, expressed an interest. I checked the, uh, the application log every morning and we contact the young people as soon as uh, an, an interest has been expressed. Um, we offer the help immediately and are with the kids uh, throughout the, the process, uh, the, the, either the two-month process from for those who start late or the 18-month process who, uh, who, who take the longer view. I've even got one uh, seventh grader who has already expressed an interest. So uh, that, that young person is already hearing from us. So we're, uh, we're, we're available to help anytime. And any questions you have, any questions the young people have, give us a call, send us an email, we'll be on it. Fantastic, thank you. Natasha, what about the ROTC? When, when would you start reaching out to the representatives for that? So the application, like I said, for the Air Force ROTC scholarship program, it'll open the summer before a student's senior year. So honestly, reach out to any advisor, all of us, if you're interested in applying as soon as possible, the moment that you have any interest in the program, just so that we can prepare um, you to make sure that you're doing well with your SAT or ACT score, get your transcript ready. Um, and like said before as well, um, the scholarship money does at some point run out this year, specifically with Air Force ROTC scholarships, the third board was completely canceled. Um, and so the sooner that you get your application in and you meet that board one, you have the possibility of obtaining a scholarship. So talk, talk to us, reach out to us so that we can help you throughout the entire process. Um, and also advise you um, if you're going through Air Force or through ROTC in general, your college applications. So I just recently kind of went through it four years ago, but I'm, I'm here to help you guys. There's a lot of essay writing as well. 
it's kind of along the same lines as the academies with all the transcripts that you might have to send in as well as maybe the letters of recommendations you got to do all that early um, so that's kind of my recommendation for you guys fantastic thank you a good follow-up to that is what is the average gpa sat and act for candidates and we'll, we'll just go through everybody right now so uh, we'll start with fritz again don't know what the average GPA is. Uh, 3.5 would be we would be good. Um, anything below 3.0 is going to be uh, is going to raise some flags. Um, minimum score on the SAT is 580 and 580. Uh, more like 650 would be more competitive. Uh, minimum on the ACT is I believe 27. Uh, 30, 31 is competitive. Um, they don't tell us what the absolute minimums are, but um, do it, do as well as you can. Um, on the SAT, ACT, take it as many times as you can stand it. We will take the best score. Benjamin, what about the US Naval Academy? Uh, so speaking for the class of 2024, the average GPA was 3.84. So it's pretty high. Um, what we look for is above like about a 3.2. Um, as with uh, West Point, we don't have a minimum. Uh, we don't publish minimums just because, you know, somebody might have a lower GPA and, you know, still be a competitive uh, applicant. But uh, a 3.2, I would say at a minimum, will look good. Um, but bear in mind, too, that, you know, you're competing against some of the best students around the country, um, even just within your region. So keep that in mind. Um, as far as the SATs, um, as Fritz pointed out, we'll accept the best score. Take it as many times as you can. Um, on average, we're looking at around about a 1,300, um, 1,250. Uh, but that's just, you know, once again, that's not a minimum, but that is roughly what you're going to see with uh, people applying. Thank you so much. And Lieutenant Needham, what, what's the Air Force Academy looking for score wise? About the same as the rest of the service academies. Uh, for the most part, if you're below 600 on the various components of the SAT or below 25 on the ACT components, you're usually not considered competitive. Uh, that being said, we don't post minimums, uh, but you are competing against your classmates for roughly a thousand slots. So keep that in mind. And GPA, same 3.8 on average, but it varies. Absolutely. And what about the ROTCs, Roy? What are you guys looking for over there? Yeah, as far as GPA, probably looking around 2.9 or higher. But of course, higher is always better. Uh, the minimum for the SAT is 1,000, and that's the very minimum. Okay, like I said, this year uh, on the first board, they were looking at 1350 and above. Okay, for ACT 19, again, that is the bare minimum, right? The higher, the better. Okay, and that those are our minimums for the for the Army side. Um, there's definitely minimums for Air Force ROTC as well. As far as GPA goes, it's a 3.0 flat. For the SAT, it's a 1240, and for the ACT, it's a 26. But once again, those are the minimums. The averages for last year's applications, the GPA was about a 3.7, and then the average for an ACT was about a 30 or a 31, whereas the average for the SAT was about a 1380. So as we've all said, we have minimums, but certainly um, aim high and try and get the higher score. Thank you. And uh, Pat, what's the Merchant Marines looking for score wise? To uh, be truly competitive, you know, the average uh, should be 630 for reading, 666 for math. Like the other academies, they uh, don't disclose the, the minimum scores. Uh, to be considered, you should have at least a B to a B plus average. And to be competitive, you should have an A minus average um, rank in class. 
which they look at is upper 40%. To be competitive, it should be in the upper 25% of your class. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Lieutenant Martineau, what's the Coast Guard looking for on scores? Yes, sir. Average SAT math is about a 680, SAT verbal 650. Average composite ACT is about a 30, and uh, GPA about a 38. Thank you so much. Um, and then my next question is actually for my colleague in the Congressman's office. Michael, how competitive is the nomination process in Oregon? And then what can advisors do to help their students? Well, um, the how competitive it is uh, varies from uh, district to district. I know for the 5th Congressional District, we had about 36 applicants to the various academies. And so uh, keep in mind, we only have 10 slots available per academy to nominate. And so you would be competing for 10 slots. Um, and from year to year, uh, it varies which academy has uh, more, more students, but it, it is pretty competitive. We have uh, really outstanding students that, 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 um, that apply that are very well rounded. And the things that we look for um, is basically what the academies are looking for. I believe our job is to try and give the academies the best candidates to select. Uh, and our ultimate goal is to have as many Oregonians attending the, the, the academies uh, uh, and you know representing our state. Um, and the it is important that you all, uh, all the students apply to your representative. So that's your member of Congress and then both senators. Um, and I will say probably the best kept secret of the academies where, um, you know, I'll probably only get one or two, uh, nomination requests is for, uh, the merchant Marines. Uh, that is by far the, uh, you know, it, if, if you're trying to increase your odds, you know, definitely apply to the merchant Marines. Um, uh, don't, 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 don't sleep on them. <laughs> and as far as, uh, what can uh, college instructors, or sorry, uh, what can advisors do? You know, I think uh, writing those letters of recommendation uh, would be good, and um, and yeah, just trying to get keep keep your keep your students on, on a timeline because they're they're they are on a timeline, and you know, I would ask the other mem panel members to give their input. Fritz, do you have any opinion on that one? Oh, you're on mute. I'm, I'm sorry. Come on. Okay. There you are. I'm sorry, on the, on, on the timeline? Um, on what advisors uh, can do to, to assist the candidates? Uh, when you say advisors, do you mean uh, we, the field force, or school advisors? Uh, uh, school advisors. We, we had a couple of advisors and like instructors ask ask this question. School school advisors can um, help the, the, the candidates uh, do well in their uh, in their academic studies, uh, do well in their school activities, uh, help the the kids with their leadership opportunities, uh, make sure the, the kids uh, take advantage of all the uh, after, after school help uh, that may be available to them in, uh, in academics. Uh, the school advisors can help the kids burnish their, their applications uh, and, and the kids should take advantage of it. Thank you so much. Um, and one last question was, do I need to take the ASVAB to attend the academies or the ROTCs? And I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of no shakes. <laughs> what about the ROTCs? No? No. Excellent. We do so, not use uh, mm -hmm. the ASVAB. We actually use your college GPA. Fantastic. So no ASVAB is needed for the academies or the ROTCs. 
And then I believe we're going to wrap it up and take a break for a while until the, the congressman jumps on. Michael, do you have any closing statements on that? Uh, yeah, we're going to put pause and turn everything off right now. And uh, we'll hope to see you here soon. Uh, cadets and grad, recent graduates uh, in front of us here today. Uh, I enjoy this. This is our sixth annual uh, uh, Service Academy Day and uh, it gets more popular seemingly every year. We've had to adapt and overcome like you guys do with this virtual format. Uh, much prefer the in-person thing, uh, but that's good training uh, for all of us. Uh, who knows, uh, you know, a lot of things happen in this world and this may not be the first episode where we're forced to go virtually on, on uh, some of our meetings and, and get togethers, but it's a great opportunity. Uh, I've got a list of questions here that have been submitted by a lot of the eager applicants wanting to know a little bit about what it's like to, uh, to get into the academy, uh, what you did, how you, uh, how you felt about things. And so I thought uh, I'd just lead off with uh, uh, a few questions. Well, I thought I'd do, if it's okay with you guys and gals, I'd just go ahead and pick one of you, start with you and ask you a few questions. But just it's just meant to be pretty informal to Get, uh, get your responses going and then just feel free to talk about anything you think would be very helpful to, uh, to a lot of these folks that want to serve their country just, uh, just, like, just like you guys. I'm going to start off with poor Easton. Uh, you know, I, we go back a few years, gets to graduate this year. It's pretty cool to see, uh, see that. Very proud of you, man. And uh, love to have you chat just a little bit about you know, some background on, on yourself and you know, why you got in and uh, has it been everything you expected? Uh, what didn't you expect? Uh, what, what was it you wished you knew and uh, maybe in high school before you all applied or might have set you up in a little better or different situation? And, you know, just, you know, uh, how the teamwork ethic is really important uh, in the service these days. So if you could start us out with a little background, sure, appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, in short, I'm from the coast, little town called Waldport. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if you never heard of it. It's 2,000 people. <laughs> so uh, great little town. Um, once again, my name is Esten. Uh, I'm currently at West Point, uh, objectively the best of the academies. Um, I'm class of 21, so getting ready to graduate here in 57 days. I am a mechanical engineering major and a unique little fact is that I went to the prep school for a year. Uh, couldn't get the SAT scores coming out of high school, and that was the path that was available to me. So I took it, and it certainly was worth it. Um, I've kept my head low, have never had to walk hours, so I'll knock on wood there. Uh, hours is a punishment at the academies. Um, you get in full uniform and just walk back and forth. So I guess I am trying to convince people to come, but anyways, <laughs> no, it's, it's all in good fun. Um, what I focused on when applying to the academies was just being a well-rounded individual. Um, of course, if you have stellar SAT, ACT scores, the academy looks at that, but if you aren't well-rounded in terms of decently personable, and uh, athletics and have shown leadership roles throughout high school, then um, you're less competitive. So I think that answered most of the questions. If there's anything else specific, I'll certainly address it. But if not, I want to leave some content for the other cadets and lieutenants. All right. All right. Well, we'll move, move, move along a little bit then. Uh, how about uh, Lieutenant Westmel from uh, the Naval Academy, recent graduate here, chat a little bit about the experience uh, like Eston did, and uh, uh, I can ask a few other questions uh, as we go along. Yeah, thanks for having us, Congressman. Um, so, uh, like you said, my name is Second Lieutenant Westmel. Uh, I'm actually a Maryland guy, so right on the complete opposite side of the country from you guys, uh, but, you know, the I can still kind of comment on the application process. It's, you know, pretty much the same for everybody, no matter where you're coming from. Um, for me, you know, I live uh, about an hour from the Naval Academy. So that was kind of always my top choice uh, when I was going through the process of looking at where I wanted to go to college. 
Um, so, you know, that was where I focused the, the bulk of my attention, uh, just trying to get to Annapolis. Um, I'll say that the Naval Academy is objectively the best service academy, just, you know, so we can all say that. <laughs> um, I was a football player at the Naval Academy, so that was definitely a, a unique experience. Um, and then I'm I think- losing a lot. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> um, one of the coolest things uh, for me being a recent graduate and now getting to work in admissions, uh, I kind of get to see, you know, both sides of it from uh, looking at, you know, new candidates applications uh, and then, you know, thinking back on my time there. Um, overall, I think, you know, being able to go to any of the service academies is a privilege. Um, definitely, you know, something uh, that you should take seriously when applying. Uh, you know, it's very competitive to get into any of the service academies and uh, being lucky enough to get the opportunity to go to one of them uh, is something, you know, you definitely need to take seriously and, um, you know, realize that the taxpayers are paying for your uh, education. So making sure you don't fall short there. Um, but, you know, the biggest thing kind of for me being a graduate, looking back on it, I was excited to leave while I was there, uh, but looking back on it, I wish I could go back, going to the, you know, the Naval Academy was probably the best decision I've ever made. So, um, love to answer more specific questions going forward, but, um, you know, definitely uh, advice to any of the people here that are still at the, in school, you know, take advantage of that time you have with your classmates. It's an opportunity that you won't get again. So uh, definitely want to, emphasize that especially for me you know kind of got uh, robbed of my final semester uh due oh, to the yeah. covid pandemic so gave me a little perspective there um but that's just kind of some general background about me i'm happy to answer any you know more specific questions as pertaining to the application process or playing a sport at one of the academies going forward very good very good excellent thanks wes that's great about Lieutenant Tony Needham, talk a little bit about the Air Force Academy. It's easy to guess with that background, uh, which which one went to the Air Force Academy, just saying. So uh, I actually aspired to that, uh, but my eyes went bad. Uh, although, you know, there's still a lot of career opportunities at the Air Force Academy, even if you're not flying the plane. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the opportunities out there, Tony? Absolutely, sir. So I am uh, Second Lieutenant Tony Needham. I'm a 2020 graduate of the Air Force Academy. Uh, so same as Lieutenant Mel, I had my last semester kind of robbed from me, which was a bit of a shame, but it was still a great time. I am from Houston, Texas, uh, and I'm currently working out here in Oregon and Washington to help all you young candidates or pre-candidates complete your application to attend the, the service academy. So I'm specifically on the Air Force Academy. I think it is the greatest thing I've ever done. The amount of opportunities that I got and I'm still getting because I went to the uh, Air Force Academy are just incredible. Uh, I went in with a dream of becoming a pilot. And not only did I get a pilot slot, but they taught me to fly while at the Academy. I spent about three years teaching other people to fly gliders at the Air Force oh. Academy. And being able to go down to the airfield every other day to get your, uh, your butt in a plane and fly, honestly to me is the greatest feeling in the world. Um, but there are plenty of other great attributes about the academy, great, plenty of awesome opportunities and projects that you can work with at any of the service academies, really. Um, but, you know, that being said, it's a great place. And uh, I think sometime next month, we'll flip a coin to see whether we'll take uh, West Point or Annapolis's place on the Commanders and Chiefs trophy, because we're kind of running out of space there, gentlemen. But anyways, <laughs> enough about a lot of throwing academy. down the gauntlet here, you guys. Holy smokes. Well, let's do Natasha then. Okay, we'll stay stay in in sync here. Natasha, if you don't mind, uh, uh, Lieutenant Natasha Urbanson, uh, recent grad, uh, missions uh, for the Air Force ROTC. Want to talk a bit about your experience and why uh, it's worthwhile for these young men and women to continue uh, in your guys' footsteps. Definitely, I went to the, I went to the University of Idaho. Sorry about that. <coughs> I went to the University of Idaho and I participated in the Air Force ROTC program there. And um, it's definitely worth it no matter where you go. Um, you guys have probably already heard the term bloom or you're planted. Um, certainly take the opportunity to get to know the community that you're in, no matter what, if it's in the, the academy or Air Force ROTC or Army ROTC, no matter where you are, latch onto the community, get to know everybody because that's gonna be your community moving on into the future. 
And so I stressed a lot when I was applying about the ACT and the SAT, and certainly they're very important for your academy application or your Air Force ROTC application. But I just wish that I didn't stress as much about that and just focus on my own character and leadership development. Um, I certainly don't save everything until the last minute because that is also going to stress you <laughs> out. But um, enjoy the process. Enjoy getting to know your community. Enjoy getting to know your gold bar recruiter, your academy liaison officer, because those people are your first step. That's your first step into getting into um, this new career and new step in your life. So that's my little two cents going into this. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it on. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go to uh, Cadet Aiden Hanneman. Uh, last but not least, Oregon State University. Congrats, Beavers. Went a long way. Lead eight, just saying, Terrapins did pretty good, but uh, lead eight, you know, for the Beavs, that's pretty, uh, pretty cool. And love to chat a little bit about Army ROTC, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you, Congressman. Yeah, we're really excited about the, uh, the elite, elite eight thing. It's uh, hasn't happened in a long time, so it's exciting. Uh, but my name is Aiden Hanneman. I'm a senior here at Oregon State University, just finishing up my last term. I'll be graduating in, uh, in June. Uh, and commissioning as a second lieutenant in the aviation branch. A um, little bit about why I joined ROTC. Uh, I'll say that when I was in high school, I was the, the type of person who wasn't sure what I wanted to do uh, in college or even after college. Um, and that's where I feel the advantage of ROTC really lies in that you can oftentimes join the program without knowing exactly what you want to do, without committing too much, uh, unless you have a scholarship, of course. Um, and that's what I did. When I, when, I, when I visited Oregon State University for the first time to come study here, I just went and talked to the Army ROTC recruiters. I also talked to the Naval ROTC recruiters and started to get a, a little bit of an idea about what the program was all about, the opportunities that they provide. And when I decided to join Army ROTC, my first year was completely uh, you know, no strings attached, just I was just trying it out so I could leave at any time. Um, but I fell in love with it and I applied to get a three-year scholarship uh, towards the end of my freshman year, which I was lucky enough to receive. Uh, now I'm finishing up my my fourth year here and I've, I've loved every second of it. Um, there's really no other, no other opportunities uh, in a regular university like that that provide the same level of development and um, you know, leadership development skills and, and training that that ROTC provides. So um, happy to answer any any questions anybody has about about the whole process. Well, Aiden, uh, why don't you chat, chat a little bit about, uh, you know, what next steps are for you? You're graduating and what do you see uh, next in line for you, your career paths or opportunities at this stage? Sure. So, uh, so I'm, like I said, I'm commissioning this June. I'll be commissioning as an active duty lieutenant, uh, but on the Army side of things over here, we have the option to uh, also commission as National Guard uh, part-time. So a lot of people do go that route, and a lot of people will um, will, will start their second lieutenant time as a part-time officer and get a civilian job on the side as well. But for me, I wanted to go active duty. Military kind of runs in my family, so I decided that I wanted to make it a, a full-time job. And I was lucky enough to branch my first choice, which is aviation. So this August, I'll be heading down to Fort Rucker, Alabama to start flight school, which is in total about 18 months. Um, and then from there, I'll get my orders to go to uh, my first duty station and just start my active duty career from there. Um, but, but, you know, a lot, a lot of it is up in the air, obviously. Um, but, but since I chose active duty, that's kind of the route that I'm going. I know if National Guard is, is kind of the, the route that you want to go, it's a little bit different and it's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more related to interviewing with specific states and the units that they have available. Uh, but when you, when you decide to go active duty through ROTC, it's a little bit of a, of a gamble for sure. Um, and you're not really sure what's going to happen, but, uh, but that'll be the, the path for me, at least for now. Very good. Very, very good. So Eston, what's the, you know, if you can remember all the way back to your freshman year, what's it like being a freshman at the academy? Uh, how, you know, fun and games, uh, easy, you know, whatever food you wanted, lots of leave. I mean, talk, talk to us how, how easy it is in this day and age to, to, to be a freshman at the academy. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, if you talk to any, uh, they, they refer to them as old grads, uh, previous graduates like uh, Fritz is an old grad. So um, if you if you speak to any of them, they'll say that our plebe year, uh, freshman year is plebe year at uh, the academies. They'll say that our plebe year is the easiest thing in the world. Um, admittedly, if you have the, my, the right mindset, it's not remarkably difficult. Um, it puts you in a position where you have to lean on others, which um, is a great position to be in. It's just a great life skill to have, to be able to rely on others and have trust that others will come through when you aren't strong enough. Um, the academies as a whole are incredible at that, um, challenging you and pushing you to the point of failure and having the uh, support systems and the avenues available to recover from that. Um, in, a, in a short timeline, so I went to the prep school, so that was a separate um, experience. And then I fed into the academy. So I had a unique plebe year because I had already known about 200 cadets, uh, my classmates from the prep school. So that made my experience freshman year here different. Uh, I still can speak on just the experience as a whole. And you come in, um, doesn't matter who you are, you're nervous. Uh, a lot of people you don't know. Um, once you say goodbye to your parents, you know nobody. And um, you go through what's called beast barracks at the academy and it's six weeks. And there's certainly like downsides to it, um, getting yelled at, waking up early, doing PT, but there's plenty of upsides. Uh, we, we got to drive tank simulators. We, we got to throw live grenades, um, shoot rocket launchers, uh, machine guns, um, anything you could imagine, great time. And as long as you have the right mindset, it's achievable by nearly anyone. It's just finding that, finding that right state of mind. Very cool, very cool. Wes, what was it like at the Naval Academy? Yeah, so for us, um, similar, I'm sure, in a lot of ways to the other academies, uh, you know, intro to your plebe year you do a little six-week program called plebe summer um it's mostly a head game you know um coming out of high school having to give up your phone uh, especially you know nowadays which is tough to do for even a couple hours you know nonetheless six weeks um for a lot of us you know for me it was the first time i'd gone that long without seeing family or you know being able to talk to anybody in my family so that that was definitely tough um I think, you know, for most people, for me, once you get through the first couple of weeks, you kind of start to get into a rhythm um, of what's going on. I think, you know, in a way it's similar to any transition period. Um, you know, once you kind of start to get in the swing of things, uh, you, you know, you're getting up early, you're getting yelled at, um, but those are all kind of things you, you know, you get used to and you settle into routine. Um, and then at the end of that, that six week program, you start, you know, your whole plebe year. Um, and, you know, they come up with little, you know, kinds of fun and games, things that the upper classmen will make you do or things you're not allowed to do, you know, certain stairwells you can't use. Um, you can only walk on one side of the hallway. You have to run everywhere you go. Just, you know, little things like that, um, kind of to, to play around with your head. Um, but in general, I, I think, what I kind of learned in the, the main goal of plebe summer and plebe year is, you know, put everything, put more on their on your plate than you can handle, give you more things to do than there is time in the day and force you to fail. Um, and then force you to be okay with asking your classmates for help. Um, and, you know, learn how to manage your time, understand that, you know, being able to prioritize certain things, you're not gonna be able to get everything done. Um, kind of learning the ropes there. Uh, Cause you know, just generally with, life in general or with military life, especially, you know, a lot of times there's more things in the day to get done than there is hours. Uh, so you need to be able to kind of prioritize your time and figure out what really needs to get done. So I think, you know, similar to a lot of the other academies, um, RTC programs that that in doc period is just kind of to 
break you down and get rid of all of those bad habits you had in high school, kind of, you know, tear down whatever bit of ego you had coming in and get everybody down on that, that same level. That way, you know, you can build the, the class up together as a unit and um, get people ready to uh, assimilate into the, the rest of the, for us, the brigade as a whole and be, you know, an effective and competent midshipman. Very good. Well, I can see we should send uh, Congress through the academy training, break us down a little bit, get rid of some of those egos and learn a little bit about teamwork. We would have a much better United States Congress, but that's small editorial uh, comment, you guys. Uh, Coast Guard has joined us. Thank you so much. Uh, wondered if there's an opportunity to hear from, from you guys a little bit about what's going on and uh, what it's like uh, to be uh, a Coast Guard uh, grad and what you experienced uh, when you were at the Academy. Whoop, she was here. Uh, and Coast Guard is elusive, guys. I tell you, if those narcotics guys trying to get into our country, I could see these we got the stealth thing down pretty good. I can't keep track of them. Hey, we'll go to Tony, if you don't mind. And following up on the teamwork thing, I mean, that's a big deal. Uh, you know, when I was back in school, you know, you weren't allowed to really to, to work together. You're supposed to do your own thing. And uh, nowadays, there's a whole different mindset about uh, how, how to be successful in this world uh, as a civilian and, and certainly uh, in the services. Talk about the, the teamwork thing and why, why that's important going forward. Yes, sir. So uh, my freshman experience, we call them dualies, is very oriented around the teamwork mentality. You can't go anywhere by yourself. You can't do anything by yourself. If someone's lagging behind, everyone that's ahead is wrong because we're not helping out those that are behind. We pass and we fail as a team. It's essentially either all or nothing. And that's really part of the point of that introduction, uh, introduction training that we have is to not only break it down, but to ingrain in you that mentality that at the end of the day we are a team we, we have our own goals we have our own aspirations but either we pass together or we fail together um, so yeah at the academy we had everything from training sessions to academics where it's, it's all partner work it's all group mentality um, on occasion we'd be giving several tests and scenarios to where you know it makes you think that you're by yourself you're on your own but at the end of the day, someone doesn't do it right, and the, the team just fails. And at the whole end of that dually experience, the end of that freshman experience, there is a, uh, call it ritual ceremony, whatever you'd like to call it, that signifies your acceptance into the cadet wing. And even that is just another team activity where you either pass together or you all fail. So yeah, no matter what academy you go to, you will be ingrained into that culture of uh, teamwork because we are all a team air force army navy coast guard everyone we all just work together for the same goal very good very very good Aiden, you talked about uh you know trying out the rotc to see if it was your thing and and then you said you fell in love what what made you, what drew you to uh rotc and falling in love with really thinking man this is the career path i want to go uh, well, to be perfectly honest, Congressman, it was a it was a combination of needing to pay for college and uh, and and wanting to serve in the military in some regard. So uh, that's good. You know, I, I know a lot of people consider ROTC because of that that benefit. If you're attending a standard university of any kind, um, and you're you're part of ROTC, there are opportunities to have them pay for your tuition. So um, yeah, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't a motivator. But um, beyond that, uh, when I when I tried out the program and when I when I started getting into the uh, you know we do a lot of tactical training to help uh, facilitate you know leadership skills. Um, when I started getting into into that side of things, I started to talk to some of the older cadets and, and hear their experiences with the program. Um, when I started to learn about the makeup of the army as a whole and about the opportunities that. Uh, that await you as an army officer. It was just something that I, that I decided was uh, what I wanted to pursue. Um, and I think there's a lot of benefits in ROTC that translate 
well over to regular life and, and university life as a whole. And I think that just about every ROTC cadet of any branch is, uh, is a little bit better prepared for their university life and for their career after graduating than someone who just goes to a class. Oh, makes sense, makes sense. That's very good. Uh, back to Eston here, I mean, one of you guys, well, actually any of you guys could comment, but I mean, how often do you actually get to see your family uh, when you enroll at one of the academies? I mean, maybe a little easier, obviously, on the on the ROTC campus. But uh, what about you guys uh, on the at the academies? Do you get to see them at all? I mean, it sounds like you know, Wes talked about being gone for that. You know, didn't see the family for a long time. What's the deal on that? Just so folks know what to expect. Yes, Congressman. There, there's really two answers to that question. There's the pre-COVID answer and the post-COVID answer, mm. because my uh, freshman, my freshman, sophomore, and first semester of junior year, um, freshman year, of course, you're limited on passes, but uh, there's plenty of opportunities. Whether your parents come to the academy, which is always a fun time, uh, get to show your parents New York City, whatever it might be. But uh, moving into sophomore and junior year, I was able to see family um, fairly often. Um, I would say I, I didn't always take the opportunity, but if I wanted to, I could see them once a month. Um, and then of course there's the long breaks. Um, moving into now with COVID, um, it's changed a lot, <laughs> yeah. but um, Assuming that there hopefully won't be another global pandemic in the next four years, I think that could stick with the plan of being able to see family fairly frequently. The rest of you guys had the same experience or? I'll take that as a yes. Coast Guard's here. Coast Guard, sorry about the technical difficulties. Apologize for that. Uh, this technology is a wonderful thing, but I'm always reminded about how a little uh, uh, old fashioned, uh, you know, handshake and personal contact can sometimes be still critical. You want to talk a little bit about the experience at the Coast Guard Academy. I've had family go through that academy and uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit and led to a great maritime career. Uh, thank you, Congressman. So my name is fourth class Sadie Wilson. So I'm a freshman now at the Coast Guard Academy and a lot of the things that the previous panelists have said, I can echo. I think coming to the Coast Guard Academy was the best decision for me. I didn't really want to go to any of the other service academies. The Coast Guard is my one goal. And um, I think that coming here is something that you, you work really hard, like individually before you get here to like earn your spot. But then once you get here, then you absolutely can't work individually. You have to work as part of a team. And that's like a, a really important lesson that everybody learns. And that's how we help each other get through all the way to graduation is just working together and depending on our shipmates. And um, to, go, to go off of the previous question on how often do we see our parents, it also kind of depends on how often your parents can come see you. So that's real world. Since we're across the country, obviously it's not very realistic for some parents to be able to leave and fly all the way across the country to come out and visit. But I know that here at the Coast Guard Academy, we actually have parents weekend in normal non-COVID years where the parents are encouraged to come out and there's special events and stuff for the parents to participate in. But um, I think in years when COVID isn't among us, there are like a reasonable amount of opportunities to see our family. Well, I think my parents would love to have had all of you as their kids instead of me, because they were lucky if they saw me in the summertime, man. I was gone. I, big country wanted to see it and travel. So you guys are much better uh, you know, kids than I was back in the day. Um, how about the, uh, how about the uh, application process? You know, all these young folks here are going through it right now and any, you know, so you've alluded to it, some of you guys a little bit, but any particular uh, uh, 
uh, thoughts, Tony, maybe on, you know, what, what they should be focusing on and, uh, and what to avoid and what questions they need to ask. Uh, you know, certainly our office, Michael Klein, as you guys have heard, is pretty sharp on all this. Alvin, too, for that matter, both have served and, you know, we have that resource for you. But what, what would you suggest uh, some, of the, uh, some of these applicants uh, focus on at this time? So uh, two things really, and the first one we've already mentioned plenty, but do not procrastinate, please do not put procrastinate. So many people have knocked themselves out of the competition just because they weren't able to submit something on time, um, especially when it comes to the medical evaluation. If you need a waiver, that can take six months. And if that waiver doesn't come through by the time we make selections, you're not getting in. Simple as that. Um, and the other thing is don't ever discriminate against yourself or knock yourself out of the competition. So some people will do this by just not applying or not finishing the application, even though they can. Others will do it by kind of suggesting that they may not be the most appropriate person for this position, or they might not be the best suited. And really, it's just that does not help your case. Modesty only goes so far. And in an application where you're competing for a one in 10 slot, it doesn't take you anywhere. Um, so during this application, I just highly recommend you put yourself in a position where you're convincing the admissions personnel that you everything you touch is solid gold, that they want you in the military because you will be the absolute best airman, soldier, seaman, whatever that you can possibly be. And that's my advice for those of you applying right now. That's good advice. It's tough to put yourself forward. I remember driving a veterinarian in the rural world, you guys. And I remember starting my own veterinary practice, having to drive from for a horse practitioner, farm to farm, trying to convince these folks I was the best thing since sliced bread, you know, as a new graduate from veterinary school, my practical experience was this big, uh, but it was tough, but you had to do it. And those are good comments. That's exactly right. You gotta be bold and talk yourself up a little bit. Uh, very important. Um, Wes, you, you indicated that uh, going to the academies was a privilege. You felt it was a real privilege to have that opportunity. And I guess just curious why you felt that way. I think that's probably a similar feeling for uh, all the folks here uh, in front of us today. What, why do you consider a privilege to be able to, to go to the academy or attend ROTC and, and represent your country? Yeah, I think... Um... You know, part of it is I kind of I grew up in a family with a long line of military service. Um, one of the things that was kind of drilled into me growing up was kind of, you know, one way or another. Uh, you know, I was told before you exploit this country, you know, you need to find a way to serve it. Um, so I think that's that's one of the things that kind of led me towards that. But I also, you know, I think. Um, for us at the Academy and those on ROTC scholarships, you know, when you're taking the, the taxpayer dime and you're taking public money to fund your personal education um, and something that's, you know, going to realistically benefit you personally going forward, um, it's something you have to take seriously and something, you know, you should have a lot of respect for. Um, you know, that, that money that's funding your education is coming from all of the hardworking men and women across the country that are you know, going to work every day and, and paying their taxes. So I, I think it's something, you know, when you're using those funds that you need to take seriously and understand that that's, that's a big responsibility and, and that, you know, America as a whole and the people that live here are making an investment in you um, to, you know, be able to get a quality education, take it seriously and, and then go forward and, and do a job. So I think that's, that's one of the other, you know, one of the reasons and um, as far as the admissions process is concerned related to that, you know, there's, there's all kinds of kids, uh, you know, young men and women across the country applying for these spots. And uh, there's a low acceptance rate. That's just the reality of it. There's a limited number of spots. Um, so, you know, obviously all of us here, you know, worked hard and tried to do something to differentiate ourselves from the group. But you know, getting one of those spots for every spot given out, you know, there's 20 kids that wish they had that spot. So when you get it, you know, you have to take responsibility and really make the most of it. Um, Cause you know, 
the way I look at it is if you go to a service academy or take an ROTC scholarship and you you squander that opportunity, you know, not only did you waste that opportunity for yourself, but you wasted an opportunity that 20, 25, 30 other kids could have had. So I think, um, you know, that's, that's part of the reason why, uh, you know, if you're looking at going to a service academy, I, th I think you should understand the, the weight of the commitment and the things that go along with it and make sure you take that seriously. Um, to kind of tie that into some admissions advice, uh, you know, with some experience I've had working at admissions for the past few months is if you're a candidate looking to apply, take ownership of your own application. Um, if you need to be communicating with your admissions counselors, um, you know, your representative's office or something, pick up the phone and make that call yourself. Um, you know, it's great. I know I understand everybody's parents care about them and want to help them out, but choosing to go to a service academy or go into um, an ROTC program is it's an adult decision. You're making a decision that's going to affect, you know, the next 10 years of your life. So if it's something that you're passionate about and that you want to pursue, take that onus on yourself to make sure, you know, you're the one picking up the phone, asking the questions that need to be asked, getting the things in to meet the deadlines, um, you know, kind of giving yourself the best opportunity you can. Um, but I think that's, you know, from me with talking to candidates and also when I was applying, taking that ownership yourself uh, to make those phone calls and do things like that shows a, a commitment to the program and also that this is a decision that you've made yourself, you know, you're not being pressured into it for the wrong reasons because um, when you get to a service academy or ROTC program, it, it's demanding. Uh, so, you know, if you're not there for the right reasons and you don't have the right motivation, uh, you're not going to be able to give the effort um, and, you know, have the success that uh, you owe to the people that are paying, you know, paying you to do your job and paying for your tuition. Very good. So I hope all the parents out there are listening very closely. You don't make the call for Johnny or Susie. John or Susie is going to make their own call, uh, make their own commitment out there. Uh, we know you're vested in their future and that's wonderful. And that's in part why some of the some of the kids are here today uh, but make sure that first step in the journey of uh, owning your own uh, your own career and your own life path which is pretty tough to do uh, but pretty pretty uh, cool to do Sadie you you talked a little bit about you know just you were focused on the Coast Guard Academy just kind of curious I me mean, I'm on the Oregon coast obviously I represent the Central Coast of the great state of Oregon, and we rely on the Coast Guard uh, every day, frankly, uh, for the rescue stuff that they do. And again, a little bit on the drug interdiction side too. But why were you drawn to the Coast Guard, and what made your interest perk there? So, thank you for that question. Um, what made me want to choose the Coast Guard Academy over other service academies is I like the missions of the Coast Guard better. I like that there's the humanitarian aspect and like you were talking about with um, you know, the search and rescue. The Coast Guard actually has 11 different missions and I won't get into all of them, but they're very diverse. And I also realized that if I was in the Coast Guard, I would probably be more likely to be either in America or stationed out of somewhere in America and then on a cutter going other places. I didn't really want to go to say the Middle East or something, even though there are some Coast Guardsmen in Bahrain right now, I wanted to stay a little bit closer and I also did want to live by the ocean. So that's what made me want to join the Coast Guard specifically. Good, very good. What do you guys say to that? Huh? Good. So Congressman, I'll speak on that really quick. Uh, something that I certainly didn't know coming into the Academy was uh, the opportunities that are available to graduates depending on your performance at the academy. Um, I, I personally, I'm about middle of my class, so I haven't over exceeded or overachieved, um, gone the extra mile and had these opportunities afforded to me. But I do have peers, close friends who they spent their whole time here studying, got remarkable grades, remarkable class rank, and uh, one of them's a Rhodes Scholar. So he's going straight to Oxford after this, and he's gonna study in England for a couple of years, all paid for. 
and then he got right. the post he wanted and the branch he wanted. So he's going to live in England for a couple of years, come back to the States for nine months and then go to Italy for the next three and then he's out. So wow. there's, de depending on what you do with your time at the academy, um, really determines your future. For me, I'm not disappointed at all. I'm a armor officer, gonna go down to Fort Benning, drive some tanks, and then uh, I'm being stationed in Fort Lewis, Washington. So coming home. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Very cool. Yeah, a lot of opportunities. I mean, that, that's the cool thing about the service that I've learned from talking to you guys over the years, that there are a lot of, a lot of different opportunities. Uh, I was a young man and Vietnam was going on and we didn't have too many opportunities. There was one direction you went and uh, uh, I, I was uh, in college at the time and war ended just as I was getting out, but it was not quite, uh, not quite the modern day military service that we have here now. And the training you get is I think applicable in almost any field of endeavor you guys want to go to. Well, we've talked a little bit about how tough things can be. Eston talked a little bit about the fun things got to do when he got to the academy. What are some of the, Natasha with uh, ROTC, what are some of the fun things? What, why, why is it kind of fun? To, I hope it's fun uh, as well as a lot of hard work. I just want to echo that it, it really is what you make of it, whether you go to the academy or through Air Force ROTC or any ROTC, um, you, as a student, specifically in Air Force ROTC, from my experience, you, you can sit back and just do the bare minimum. And you can uh, compete for a field training slot. You may or may not get it. Um, you may or may not commission, but you can do the bare minimum. But where's the fun in that, first of all? And you're not really commute, uh, you're not being a part of your community that way. The given community within Air Force ROTC and the community of the people who are paying for your tuition. And if you aren't on scholarship and you don't get into the Air Force Academy or one of the academies um, and you don't get an Air Force ROTC scholarship, still participate in a scholar in, in, an, in a ROTC program. It's a really awesome opportunity to one, study abroad. Uh, that's what I, I did. I did Project Global Officer. So as an ROTC cadet, that opportunity is available to you. I studied Arabic. I intensively studied that. And it was a really unique environment because I got to interact with Army, Navy, and Marines while abroad. So we were all together in a different country. Um, either we were in one apartment complex or um, we were sharing a house with um, one of the people who we were at, like in Morocco for me specifically, I had, I was staying there as a guest. And so it's just a unique opportunity that you wouldn't really necessarily think of and it was fully paid for. And so it's an, another opportunity that you can potentially take advantage of um, to further your education for one or for if you're studying a language. Um, and then the second thing is that you get to make those cross-cultural, intercultural connections. And so that's super important. Some other fun things that are available are internships. Um, so I personally went to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and I got to, to uh, utilize my Arabic skills and translate some documents. Might not sound the most fun to you guys, but it was fun for me to be able to participate and see that Intel world for a bit. And then during your summers, of course, you go to field training. And as an Air Force ROTC cadet in general, I was, for the most part, a normal college student. And so I got to go rock climbing with my friends and go to coffee shops all the time. So did a lot of studying. <laughs> so that was my experience. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we should probably wrap it up. I, it's just wonderful to hear you guys talk. It sounds like there's a little bit of opportunity for all different types of people to serve their country. And I, uh, I really appreciate you all stepping up and, and, and serving. It does in these tough times, these COVID times, uh, and frankly, in the partisan political environment that we seem to be in, doggone it, uh, you guys bring us together. You're always a uniting feature in the United States Congress. Uh, you know, we argue a lot. We're all, you know, up in the trees on this issue and that issue. But, uh, by and large, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act usually flies through a great bipartisan support and uh, trying, you know, just nice to see uh, young men and women living up to the ideals uh, that this country, I think, was founded on. And I just really impressed as I listened to you all 
talk and it just sounds like there's a bunch of wonderful i wish i was uh 18 again man it'd be pretty cool uh to get back in i probably physically would fall apart at this point but back in the day that would have been uh fun uh invigorating a learning experience test yourself uh and i love the teamwork emphasis that is the key to success in life i mean you know, we all are pretty proud people and certainly have a little bit of ego or you wouldn't be doing some of the things you all are doing, but uh, you realize pretty quickly you can't do it alone. And that's a that's a humbling but important lesson for us all to learn. So anyway, I hope it's been uh, enjoyable for all of you. I want to thank our panelists for taking the time uh, uh, to come and chat with you all. Uh, it's very important, I think, for uh, these young men and women that want to go to the academies to go through ROTC to get a flavor of what it's really like. So they're, they really know what they're up against and know what their opportunities are. Tremendous opportunities, it sounds like, uh, going forward. Uh, and I uh, want to thank everybody. Hopefully, we'll do this again a year from now, and it will be in person. COVID will be in the rear view mirror. The next graduating class won't have to go through what Eston and others are going through. It's just... Uh, you know, it'd be nice to do that in person. The academies are beautiful places. Uh, uh, the college campuses, a big fan also. So thank you guys for serving your country and stepping up. And I hope for everybody out there, it's been a, a worthwhile experience here today. And if you have any other questions or follow-up questions, I'm sure these young men would be glad to, uh, you know, chat with you. And uh, certainly Michael Klein uh, uh, is my, my right-hand man and knows this stuff inside and out. And, if you have any problems with the applications or, or uh, anything, please make sure you, you call our office. So uh, thank you for stepping up and serving your country and look forward to doing this again a year from now.